Say when. Now? This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. I'm speaking with Mr. William Brown, manager of the microwave power transmission program at the Raytheon Company from the United States. Mr. Brown, we've just heard Dr. Glazer explain the concept of the solar power satellite station, a platform in space which picks up the sun's en energy continuously and relays it to ground by microwaves. Now, for many people, that's a mysterious concept, relaying energy without wires. How is that done? Well, as you know, <coughs> microwaves are used every day for relaying television signals. Uh, <coughs> the the uh, signals are sent up from the Earth at 23,000 miles in space, and then they're relayed across the whole world to another, another section of the uh, world. Uh, <coughs> in this particular case, however, we're using these same microwaves in a different way. We're using them to transfer power efficiently. Ordinary communication signals are not used to transfer energy efficiently. But here, we use much larger antennas, antennas of a different size that, than are used for uh, communications. And they're so large that we can focus this energy into relatively efficient patterns. How would you characterize the size of the antenna in space and then the size of the antenna receiving antenna on the ground? Well, for the solar power satellite station that Dr. Glazer has talked about, the transmitting antenna is one kilometer in diameter, and the ground array is about eight kilometers in diameter. That's very big. Would that have to be an area that people would be excluded from? Uh, yes, uh, they would certainly have to be excluded from that area. Uh, the signal, the signal uh, <clears throat> when it reaches the ground, is a, a fairly dilute signal, but it's spread out over a large area. And the signal is the greatest in the middle, and then, like a bell-shaped curve, it uh, reduces at the edges. And within a very small distance of the edge of this receiving array, the signals are down to such a low level that there is no danger to any biota, man or animal, or vegetable uh, matter that may be in that area. When people think of an antenna, they think of a very large structure that is uh, very difficult to move and, and very heavy. Uh, has any progress been made in reducing the weight or, or size of such large structures? Well, we know we usually have uh, the microwaves uh, associate parabolic reflectors with microwaves. But here, uh, in this case, is a new technology that uh, has recently been evolved for things like the solar power satellite, in which the antenna is actually antenna is actually uh, built on a piece of thin plastic uh, like you would find at the ordinary uh, grocery store and uh, these patterns are etched on the surface and we add little diodes uh, at intervals here and then this whole array uh, very efficiently uh, captures the uh, microwave beam and converts it back into ordinary electrical power that we're all familiar with. That Microwaves come in here and coming out here on either end is just ordinary electrical power. Mm -hmm. This is done very efficiently with an efficiency of about 85 percent. Uh, this uh, particular piece of plastic is uh, opaque, but I understand you may be able to put it on clear plastic or glass and thus put it on the roof of a greenhouse. Well, that, that is possible. And uh, certainly in a large rectenna area, you might find many applications in which you would want to use the energy directly for manufacturing and indeed you might want to put this on the roof and if you wanted to grow plants underneath it uh, that would be possible although I think probably uh, uh, we still have plenty of area in the United States to uh, grow things and uh, this is not a problem in the United States although it might be elsewhere. That's one of the interesting points is that this uh, orbit is over equatorial countries even though it's very far out in space is it possible to slant the beam so that it can reach a country like the United States that's somewhat north of the equator? Well, that, is no, that really is no problem. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the beam uh, on the equator is 23,000 miles out. That's a long distance from the Earth. And uh, you can beam energy efficiently as, as far north as England, perhaps even Iceland. Of course, you can't beam it to the North Pole. The station in space uh, at uh, 23,000 miles out, rotates at the same speed as the Earth. So it appears as a fixed object. 
uh, up in the sky. If you could see it, you won't be able to see it optically. But it stays directly over uh, a spot on the equator, and therefore there is a direct line between it and any spot on the surface of the Earth. But for third world countries that are on the equator, uh, would it be a simpler procedure to relay energy to them than, say, to the Soviet Union or Canada, which are somewhat further north? Oh, yes. I, I think that uh, the, those countries that are closest to the equator um, uh, have an advantage in that respect because the rectenna size is proportionally smaller at the equator than it is, say, in North America or in Europe. How many of these uh, microwave uh, relays do you envision might be possible uh, from space? How many satellites could safely be built or built that were in such a way that they wouldn't interfere with each other? Well, these are power satellites, and, and uh, they would not uh, interfere uh, with each other. So they could be placed uh, uh, almost uh, side by side. What about international communications? How would they have to be adjusted to accommodate such an energy transmission system? Well, the transmitter uh, has to be very free of emitting any other signal at any other frequency, any signal at any other frequency than the one this is used at. Now, we use a single frequency uh, for the solar power satellite. So, on the technical side, there are no sidebands. There is no spreading of the spectrum outside of that, that single frequency, providing the tubes and the devices that we use in space are free of what we call noise. Now, as part of the NASA Department of Energy study that was made in the United States, that was looked into uh, very thoroughly. And we believe in that data that it is possible to have these stations in the sky and not have them interfere with ordinary microwave communications. Now, there is a problem with highly scientific uh, type of gear on the Earth. And they, in order to be compatible, uh, their equipment will have to be uh, specially equipped with filters uh, to perhaps filter out some of this very low noise. You're talking about some of the large radio telescopes that astronomers use to yes, study that's the heavens? Yes, talking about, yes. But this wouldn't be like your neighbor turning on a power tool and interrupting the Saturday football game, would no, it? No, you can be sure that that would be much better taken care of than that, yes. How have people at Unispace 82 reacted to these concepts as they affect communications and development? Uh, so far at the conference uh, that I've been to, that hasn't uh, uh, been an issue. Uh, this may be an issue uh, someplace in the conference uh, later on, but so far, as far as I know, it has not been. Will there be other international forums at which this issue will be discussed over the years as the concept emerges? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that there will be. I don't know of any scheduled at the, uh, at the present time. But certainly there has been enough interest in the solar power satellite uh, in the international community and on the part of many people in the United States uh, to uh, keep this program alive. And uh, I'm confident that uh, eventually it, it may be 10, 15 years before we get really started on the final development of it. But I'm confident, confident that that time will come. So you agree with Dr. Glaze it will be 15, 20 years hence? Oh, yes, I think so. Yes. Thank you very much. We've been speaking with Mr. William C. Brown, manager, microwave power transmission for the Raytheon Corporation, the world's leading expert on the transmission of energy by wireless microwave. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. I'm speaking to Dr. Rashmi Mayor, the vice chairman of the NGO meeting here at Unispace. Dr. Mayor, what is the purpose of your meeting here? Well, the purpose of our meeting is to bring the ideas and concepts to the government from various non-governmental organizations from around the world. And uh, we are hoping that with these ideas, we will be able to enrich the final document of the government when it is going to be implemented. 
The NGOs have a meeting over here while the government people are meeting at the Hofburg. What role does your meeting play relative to theirs? Well, our main role is to bring the ideas of scientific community, the educational community, and the people at large uh, who are not working for the government. We actually represent the ideas of people. And uh, we want to bring these ideas to the government in order that they are assimilated uh, in terms of the planning of space for the future of mankind. The term uh, NGO sometimes confuses people. Could you explain your relationship uh, to the UN? Well, actually, that is uh, nothing confusing. We are all official uh, with the United Nations. These are the organizations which are not the governmental. That's about all. Like, it could be an institute, uh, it could be international organization, it could be many other uh, organizations around the world. I understand that you have a science and environment background and you've worked in India in urban planning and other uh, public functions? Yeah, well, my main, I am an environmental and uh, space scientist. My concern is to bring to this meeting and many international forums the ideas and the problems and applications of space technologies for third world developments. And as you know, we had a whole day meeting yesterday on how the space can be applied to the problems of third world. Now, as you, I think you may be aware, uh, basically this conference was initiated and planned for the third world problems. Uh, I think the advanced countries already have their science and technologies. Unfortunately, in the politics of the UN conference, the third world has not received the kind of importance uh, that it should receive in terms of attacking the massive problematics uh, of the third world. Third world means the people who live in Africa, Asia, and South America. How do they see space as playing a role in solving their problems? Well, uh, unfortunately, many of the, the people in uh, developing countries live in, uh, in villages uh, where, of course, the space does have a very important role to play. But most of these people do not have any conception of space because they are so much confined and they don't know much about these latest technology. But I, as, as I pointed out yesterday in my session for the whole day, in every area of development uh, in Africa, Asia, and South America, the space can play a very important role. Education, agriculture, disaster warning, the water table understanding, the mapping of resources, planning. I mean, there's no area in which a space cannot play an important role. So I think uh, it is good that this conference is held but we have to bring better education and awareness to the people of the world as to what space can do for them. What are the chief areas of dispute between the what's been called the, the north-south split between the richer and the poorer nations? What are the chief points of contention? Well, the chief point of contention is that the space should not be militarized because today the two superpowers are on a collision path of, uh, of spending uh, up to even 80% of their budget on militarizing space and weaponizing space. And if once the space is weaponized, there is no future for the third world because there is no money to be used for alternative uses like environmental planning, resource developments, and so on. So I think the main, I think the area of contention is this, the demilitarizing space as the people in the third world want and I think it may so happen that the two superpowers may go ahead with the militarization of space. At this conference, uh, space military systems are officially off the agenda. Do you think the third world is going to get it on the agenda? And what part of the conference do you think will do that? Well, I think uh, the third world does want to have a, some discussion on these problems of uh, m militarization of space. Uh, so, that, uh, so that the superpowers understand the feelings of the two-thirds of the humanity. I do not know whether they will succeed in discussing in the plenary or in the special committee. As uh, you heard this morning, that this issue is still to be uh, settled today. But uh, I am hoping that the people who are in the non-governmental organizations will play an important role in, uh, uh, in influencing the governments to pass a resolution uh, which will, which will uh, ban any military activities in space as it was decided according to the 1968 uh, Space Treaty.
Is there a specific proposal for any kind of space systems that would help the third world uh, bring a peaceful environment to space? Well, I think you are asking a very important question. And the question is, has the United Nations prepared a package plan for third world development through space? I say no. I think there are broad general statements in the draft resolution of the United Nations, as you can see, but we don't have a package plan in terms of the specific amount of monies to be spent on weather forecasting, agricultural development, resource planning, and so on. I haven't seen in the draft plan, and I hope that this conference will not be the end. We'll go after the conference to preparing such a package plan, which will lead to the application of space for the third world development. Now, the governments may not do it, or the United Nations may not do it, but it is the duty of the people at large uh, to prepare the package plans and get the funds and see that they apply to solve the problems of the world. One of the proposals that's come up here is the creation of a UN Space Center or UN Space Agency. Yeah. What kind of uh, contribution could such a development provide? Well, personally, I have seen uh, too many, too fat uh, bureaucracies uh, developing in the government and in the United Nations. Uh, I feel uh, that such a center should not be set up at this stage. Uh, I think what we need is the series of activities, intergovernmentally planned, which would lead to the development of these packages. But once you set up a big bureaucracy in the United Nations, the large amount of funds will be wasted in maintaining that bureaucracy and the common man will not benefit. And so I think what we require are the people's organizations which will prepare the simple plans, which will reach the common man and which will have the funds available from the people themselves. What do you feel about the possibility of, a, of UN satellite surveillance to contribute to uh, military uh, intelligence for those people interested in keeping the peace rather than planning military well, operations? Well, the United Nations is not in, uh, not in the business of putting satellites. Uh, this is not their work. The United Nations keeps the record of all the satellites, and I don't think the United Nations has the capability or funds to do these kind of activities because the United Nations is not a government. It does not run the space centers, and uh, I don't think uh, that is uh, feasible at this stage. What about the th concern of third world countries that surveillance from space for commercial as well as military purposes puts them at a unique disadvantage where sometimes multinational corporations have more information about resources in their own country than they do? Of course they do. And this is, uh, I think the time has come that there should be some international efforts to control, monitor, and, uh, and, uh, and the plan these uh, activities of surveillance in the third world, which are done by these either the multinational corporations which are running these uh, um, space centers or done by somebody else. So uh, I think my, my own feeling is uh, that the international activities uh, should be so planned that they control uh, the, uh, the, uh, the interference in the, some of these countries. One final question. What about the geosynchronous orbit? Some countries such as uh, Colombia and others have said that special allocation should be made for those countries that lie on the equator. Is that a issue that there is a consensus in the third world about? I don't think so because uh, first of all this kind of a claim uh, violates uh, the, the 1968 treaty that space belongs to the whole mankind. Also, 79 moon treaty that everything in space belongs to mankind. And the geosynchronous orbit may be on the, uh, the above many of these third world countries. I think geosynchronous orbit or any orbit does not belong to the third world. It belongs to the humanity, and I think it should be used by humanity through international cooperation to see that the benefits come to all the people and not to a few people. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi Mayur. Thank this you. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. Thank you for inviting me. Many, many thanks.